is to give the three sets of axioms. But it is very easy to explain the main point of measurement. 331. Difference between the theories, without being led too far from the philosophical discussion. In the first place, a definition of a L-plane can be given which is common to all the three theories. The definition already given in Chapter 3 of this part will suffice. But an alternative definition can be stated thus. If A, B, C, B any three non-collinear points, and A, B, B, C, C, A denote the three complete straight lines containing, T respectively, A and B, band C, C and A, then the straight lines which respectively intersect both members of any pair of these three lines, not both lines a tone of the corners A or B or C, pass through all the points constituting one plane, and all their incident points are incident in the plane. Thus a plane is defined to be the locus of all the points incident in at least one of such a group of straight lines. The axioms are such that this definition is equivalent to 505, the definition in Chapter 3. Also the axioms secure that any straight line, passing through two points in a plane, is itself totally incident in that plane. Also it follows from the definition of a plane that a line L and a point P, not incident in I, are coplanar. The distinction between the three geometrical theories can now be explained by the aid of such a triplet, a point P, a line 1 not passing through P, and the plane, 3 in which P and 1 air both incident. Consider all the lines through P and incident in the plane, 3. Then in the elliptic geometrical theory, all these lines intersect the line 1. In the Euclidean geometrical theory, all these lines intersect the line 1, with the exception of one and only one line the unique parallel to 1 through P. In the hyperbolic geometrical theory the lines through P in the plane are divisible into two classes, one class consisting of the lines intersecting 1, the other class consisting of the lines not intersecting L, and each class with an infinite number of members. Then it has been shown by Cayley and Vaughn. Stop 1 that the congruence of segments and the numerical measures of the distances involved are definable. The simplest case is that of Euclidean geometry. In that case the basic fact is that the opposite sides of parallelograms are equal. A further complication is required to define congruence between segments which are not parallel. But it would serve no purpose to enter into the detailed solutions of this mathematical problem. But the illustration afforded by the particular case of the congruence of the opposite sides of parallelogram est enables the general principle underlying the notion of congruence to be explained. Two segments are congruent when there is a certain analogy between their functions in a systematic pattern of straight lines, which includes both of them. The definition of this analogy is the definition of con R506 fluence in terms of non-metrical geometry. It is possible to discover diverse analogies which give definitions of congruence which are inconsistent with each. 1 CF Cayley's LL6 Memoir on Quanties, Transactions of the Royal Society, 1859, von Stout's Geometrie der Lage, 1847, and Beitrige zur Geometrie der Lage, 1856. 332. The Theory of Extension. Other. 
That definition which enters importantly into the internal constitutions of the dominating social entities is the important definition for the cosmic epic in question. Measurement is now possible throughout the extensive continuum. This measurement is a systematic procedure dependent on the dominant societies of the cosmic epoch. When one form of measurement has been given, alternative forms with assigned mathematical relations to the initial form can be defined. One such system is as good as any other, so far as mathematical procedure is concerned. The only point to be remembered is that each system of coordinates must have its definable relation to the analogy which constitutes congruence. Section B. Physical measurement is now possible. The modern procedure, introduced by Einstein, is a generalization of the method of least action. It consists in considering any continuous line between any two points in the spatio-temporal continuum and seeking to express the physical properties of the field as an integral along it. The measurements which are presupposed are the geometrical measurements constituting the coordinates of the various points involved. Various physical quantities enter as the constants involved in the algebraic functions concerned. These constants depend on the actual occasions which atomize the extensive continuum. The physical properties of the medium are expressed by various conditions satisfied by this integral. It is usual to term an infinitesimal element of this integral by the name of an element of distance. But this name, though satisfactory as a technical phraseology, is entirely misleading. There can be no theory of the congruence of different elements of the path. The notion of coincidence does not apply. There is no systematic 507J theory possible, since the so-called infinitesimal distance depends on the actual entities throughout the environment. The only way of expressing such so-called distance is to make use of the presupposed geometrical measurements. The mistake arises because, unconsciously, the minds of physicists are infected by a presupposition which comes down from Aristotle through Kant. Aristotle placed quantity among his categories and did not distinguish between extensive quantity and intensive quantity. Kant made this distinction, but considered both of them as categorial notions. It follows from Cayley's and von Stout's work, C.F. Low A, C.I.T., that extensive quantity is a construct. The current physical theory presupposes a comparison of so-called lengths among segments without any theory as to the basis on which this comparison is to be made, and in ignoration of the fact that all exact observation belongs to the mode of presentational immediacy. Further, the fact is neglected that there are no infinitesimals, and that a comparison of finite segments is thus required. For this reason, it would be better so far as measurement. 333 explanation is concerned to abandon the term distance for this integral and to call it by some such name as impetus, suggestive of its physical import. Point two, it is to be noted. However, that the conclusions of this discussion involve no objection to the modern treatment of ultimate physical laws in the guise of a problem in differential geometry. The integral impetus is an extensive quantity, a, length. The differential element of impetus is the differential element of systematic length weighted with the individual peculiarities of its relevant environment. 
The whole theory of the physical field is the interweaving of the individual peculiarities of actual occasions upon the background of systematic geometry. This systematic geometry expresses the most general, substantial form, inherited throughout the vast cosmic society which 508 constitutes the primary real potentiality conditioning concrescence point 3 in this doctrine, the organic philosophy is very near to the philosophy of DC Descartes. The whole argument can be summarized thus. I actual occasions are immovable, so that the doctrine of coincidence is nonsense. The extensive quantity is a logical construct, expressing the number of congruent units which are a non-overlapping, and b exhaustive of the nexus in question. E congruence is only definable as a certain definite analogy of function in a systematic complex which embraces both congruent elements. I V that all experimental measurement involves ultimate intuitions of congruence between earlier and later states of the instruments employed. V that all exact observation is made by perception in the mode of presentational immediacy. V that if such perception merely concerns a private psychological field, science is the daydream of an individual without any public import. V that perception in the mode of presentational immediacy solely depends upon the witness of this body and only exhibits the external contemporary world in respect to its systematic geometrical relationship to the body. 2 CF. My book, The Principle of Relativity, University Press, Cambridge, 1922. 3. This theory of the derivation of the basic uniformity requisite for congruence, and thence for measurement, should be compared with that of two deeply interesting articles. I. The theory of relativity and the first principles of science and E. The 1 TF Acroscopic Atomic Theory, Journal of Philosophy, Volume 25, T. By Professor F. S. C. Northbrook of Yale, I cannot adjust his doctrine of a macroscopic atom to my cosmological outlook. Nor docks this notion seem necessary if my doctrine of microscopic atomic occasions be accepted. But Professor Northrup's theory does seem to be the only alternative if this doctrine be abandoned. I regret that the articles did not come under my notice till this work had been finally revised for publication. Part vs. Final Interpretation Chapter I The Ideal Opposites Section I 512J The chief danger to philosophy is narrowness in the selection of evidence. This narrowness arises from the idiosyncrasies and timidities of particular authors, of particular social groups, of particular schools of thought, of particular epochs in the history of civilization. The evidence relied upon is arbitrarily biased by the temperaments of individuals, by the provincialities of groups, and by the limitations of schemes of thought. The evil, resulting from this distortion of evidence, is at its worst in the consideration of the topic of the final part of this investigation ultimate ideals. We must commence this topic by an endeavor to state impartially the general types of the great ideals which have prevailed at sundry seasons and places. Our test in the selection, T to be impartial, must be pragmatic. The chosen stage of exemplification must be such as to compel attention, by its own intrinsic interest, or by the intrinsic interest of the results which flow from it. 
For example, the stern say 1F restraint of the Roman farmers in the early history of the Republic issued in the great epic of the Roman Empire, and the stern self-restraint of the early Puritans in New England issued in the flowering of New England culture. The epic of the Covenanters has had for its issue the deep impression which modern civilization owes to Scott one end. Neither the Roman farmers, nor the American Puritans, nor the Covenanters, can wholly command allegiance. Also they differ from each other. But in either case, there is greatness there, greatly exemplified. In contrast to this example, we find the flowering time of the aesthetic culture of ancient Greece, the Augustan epoch in Rome, the Italian Renaissance, the Elizabethan epoch in England, the Restora. Tion epoch in England, 13 rupees French and Teutonic civilization throughout the centuries of the modern world, modern Paris, and modern New York. Moralists have much to say about some of these societies. Yet, while there is any critical judgment in the lives of men, such achievements can never be forgotten. In the estimation of either type of these contrasted examples, sheer contempt betokens blindness. In each of these instances, there are elements which compel admiration. There is a greatness in the lives of those who build up religious systems, a greatness in action, in idea and in self-subordination, embodied in instance after instance through centuries of growth. There is a greatness in the rebels who destroy such systems. 337 338 Final interpretation they are the titans who storm heaven, armed with passionate sincerity. It may be that the revolt is the mere assertion by youth of its right to its proper brilliance, to that final good of immediate joy. Philosophy may not neglect the multifariousness of the world the fairies dance, and Christ is nailed to the cross. Section 2 there are various contrasted qualities of temperament, which control the formation of the mentalities of different epochs. In a previous chapter, Part 2, ch. X, attention has already been drawn to the sense of permanence dominating the invocation less than abide with me, and the sense of flux dominating the sequel less than fast falls the eventide. Ideals fashion themselves round these two notions, permanence and flux. In the inescapable flux, there is something that abides. In the overwhelming permanence, there is an element that escapes into flux. Permanence can be snatched only out of flux, and the passing moment can find its adequate intensity only by its submission to permanence. Those who would disjoin the two elements can find no interpretation of patent facts. The four symbolic figures in the Medici Chapel in Florence Michelangelo's masterpieces of statuary, Day 514, and Night, Evening and Dawn exhibit the everlasting elements in the passage of fact. The figures stay there, reclining in their recurring sequence, forever showing the essences in the nature of things. The perfect realization is not merely the exemplification of what an abstraction is timeless. It does more. It implants timelessness on what in its essence is passing. The perfect moment is fadeless in the lapse of time. Time has then lost its character of perpetual perishing, it becomes the moving image of eternity. Section 3 Another contrast is equally essential for the understanding of ideals. The contrast between order is the condition for excellence, and order is stifling the freshness of living. This contrast is met with in the theory of education. The condition for excellence is a thorough training in technique. 
Sheer skill must pass out of the sphere of conscious exercise, and must have assumed the character of unconscious habit. The first, the second, and the third condition for high achievement is scholarship, in that enlarged sense including knowledge and acquired instinct controlling action. The paradox which wrecks so many promising theories of education is that the training which produces skill is so very apt to stifle imaginative zest. Skill demands repetition, and imaginative zest is tinged with impulse. Up to a certain point each gain in skill opens new paths for the imagination. But in each individual formal training has its limit of usefulness. B. Ideal opposites. 339 yon that limit there is degeneration. The lilies of the field toil not, neither do they spin. The social history of mankind exhibits great organizations in their alternating functions of conditions for progress, and of contrivances for stunting humanity. The history of the Mediterranean lands, and of Western Europe, is the history of the blessing and the crescent of political organizations, of religious organizations, of 515 schemes of thought, of social agencies for large purposes. The moment of dominance, prayed for, worked for, sacrificed for, by generations of the noblest spirits, marks the turning point where the blessing passes into the curse. Some new principle of refreshment is required. The art of progress is to preserve order amid change, and to preserve change amid order. Life refuses to be embalmed alive. The more prolonged the halt in some unrelieved system of order, the greater the crash of the dead society. The same principle is exhibited by the tedium arising from the unrelieved dominance of a fashion in art. Europe, having covered itself with treasures of Gothic architecture, entered upon generations of satiation. These jaded epics seem to have lost all sense of that particular form of loveliness. It seems as though the last delicacies of feeling require some element of novelty to relieve their massive inheritance from bygone system. Order is not sufficient. What is required, is something much more complex. It is order entering upon novelty, so that the massiveness of order does not degenerate into mere repetition, and so that the novelty is always reflected upon a background of system. But the two elements must not really be disjoined. It belongs to the goodness of the world, that its settled order should deal tenderly with the faint discordant light of the dawn of another age. Also order, as it sinks into the background before new conditions, has its requirements. The old dominance should be transformed into the firm foundations, upon which new feelings arise, drawing their intensities from delicacies of contrast between system and freshness. In either alternative of excess, whether the past be lost, or be dominant, the present is enfeebled. This is only an application of Aristotle's doctrine of the 1901 den mean. The lesson of the transmutation of causal efficacy into presentational immediacy is that great ends are reached by life in the present, life novel and immediate, but deriving its richness by its full inheritance from the rightly organized 516J animal body. It is by reason of the body, with its miracle of order, that the treasures of the past environment are poured into the living occasion. The final percipient root of occasions is perhaps some thread of happenings wandering in, empty, space amid the interstices of the brain. It toils not, neither does it spin. It receives from the past, it lives in the present.
It is shaken by its intensities of private feeling, aversion or aversion. In its turn, this culmination of bodily life transmits itself as an element of novelty throughout the avenues of the body. Its sole use to the body is its vivid originality, it is the organ of novelty. 340. Final Interpretation. Section IV. The world is thus faced by the paradox that, at least in its higher actualities, it craves for novelty and yet is haunted by terror at the loss of the past, with its familiarities and its loved ones. It seeks escape from time in its character of perpetua IIY perishing. Part of the joy of the new years is the hope of the old round of seasons, with their stable facts of friendship, and love, and old association. Yet conjointly with this terror, the present is mere unrelieved preservation of the past assumes the character of a horror of the past, rejection of it, revolt. To die be given, or attain, fierce work it were to do again. Tilda. Each new epic enters upon its career by waging unrelenting war upon the aesthetic gods of its immediate predecessor. Yet the culminating fact of conscious, rational life refuses to conceive itself as a transient enjoyment, transiently useful. In the order of the physical world its role is defined by its introduction of novelty. But, just as physical feelings are haunted by the vague insistence of causality, so the higher and ii actual feelings are haunted by the vague insistence of another order, where there is no unrest, no travel, no shipwreck, there shaii be no more sea. 517 This is the problem which gradua IIY shapes itself as religion reaches its higher phases in civilized communities. The most general formulation of the religious problem is the question whether the process of the temporal world passes into the formation of other actualities, bound together in an order in which novelty does not mean loss. The ultimate evil in the temporal world is deeper than any specific evil. It lies in the fact that the past fades, that time is a perpetual perishing. Objectification involves elimination. The present fact has not the past fact put it in any full immediacy. The process of time veils the past below distinctive feeling. There is a unison of becoming among things in the present. Why should there not be novelty without loss of this direct unison of immediacy among things? In the temporal world, it is the empirical fact that process entails loss, the past is present under an abstraction. But there is no reason, of any ultimate metaphysical generality, why this should be the whole story. The nature of evil is that the characters of things are mutual IIY obstructive. Thus the depths of life require a process of selection. But the selection is elimination is the first step towards another temporal order seeking to minimize obstructive modes. Selection is at once the measure of evil, and the process of its evasion. It means discarding the element of obstructiveness in fact. No element in fact is ineffectual. Thus the struggle with evil is a process of building up a mode of utilization by the provision of intermediate elements introducing a complex structure of harmony. The triviality in some initial reconstruction of order expresses the fact that actualities are being produced, which, trivial in their own. Ideal opposites. 341. Proper character of immediate, ends, are proper, means, for the emergence of a world at once lucid, and intrinsically of immediate worth. 
the evil of the world is that those elements which are translucent so far as transmission is concerned, in themselves are of slight weight, and that those elements 518 with individual weight, by their discord, impose upon vivid immediacy the obligation that it fade into night. He giveth his beloved sleep. In our cause.